OK. Uh, so hello, everybody. Uh, just a second. OK, uh, so uh, hello, everybody. Good evening. Uh, I hope you can hear me and see me well. Uh, first of all, uh, welcome uh, to this next lecture uh, uh, called Environmental, Social and Corporate Governance, ESG and Sustainability. Uh, my name is Tomislav uh, from University of Zagreb, Faculty of Mechanical Engineering uh, and Naval, uh, Naval Architecture. Uh, and today, together with uh, uh, Adela uh, and Anna, uh, I will be your host uh, uh, within this topic. Uh, just at the very beginning, maybe just a few uh, technical remarks. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have the opportunity uh, to have two way communication, so you can't ask questions live, unfortunately. Uh, but what you can do uh, is to ask questions and give comments in the chat box. Uh, and I uh, invite you to do so, uh, especially if uh, something is not clear or if you have any uh, any questions. Uh, feel free to uh, to put them in the chat. Uh, so today uh, today's topic is, as I said, so it's ESG, uh, environmental, social, and corporate governments uh, and sustainability. Uh, and uh, the idea is uh, that we will go through. Uh, let's say in the first part we will be a bit more technical, uh, since I am. Uh, uh, I am a professor at mechanical engineering at the energy department, so uh, my part will be a little bit more technical in a sense that I will tell you uh, a little bit more about the uh, ESG, the criteria, uh, the importance, the ratings, uh, development of plans, etc. And then uh, uh, afterwards, Atello will uh, go a little bit more into the communication uh, aspects. Uh, and then at the end, uh, Anna will uh, uh, tell you a little bit more about the uh, assignment uh, for today's uh, for today's lectures. OK, so uh, let's uh, uh without further ado let's let's continue uh with our uh, topic for today uh so uh let's say uh first of all for any of you that uh are hearing uh, about esg for the first time uh the term esg basically dates back uh as let's say 2004 uh, where the main idea was uh, to help investors actually uh, in order to evaluate different kind of uh, companies, uh, firms, uh, uh, not just based on their commercial performance or uh, their commercial success, but try to evaluate them uh, how do they relate or how do they perform uh, uh, regarding environmental and social records or uh, and their governments. Uh, and in order to do so, uh, we are trying to set some kind of numerical scores in order for us to compare different companies, because at the end, uh, if you have an opportunity to invest or opportunity to cooperate or opportunity to use a certain product, uh, that might be the same price, uh, you would very much uh, like to uh, use or invest in those that have uh, more uh, uh, more uh, uh, social or, or environmental uh, impact or less social uh, or environmental impact. Uh, so this is the 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 uh, the main uh, the, the main theory or the main idea be behind uh, behind ESG, although afterwards uh, uh, ESG is not just uh, a, a tool or a mechanism for someone to evaluate you, but it's also a, a tool or, or a mechanism how a certain company uh, can be better regarding environmental, social or, 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 or governance. Uh, 
so the importance of ESG. Uh, let's let's look at this. So ESG allows companies to take a comprehensive view of their impact on the world. By considering ESG factors, companies can better understand their uh, their role in society and take steps to address any negative impacts they might be having. Well, this is uh, a very romantic uh, way of defining uh, things. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, if you look at if you look at uh, some headlines in in certain uh, in certain uh, uh, journals or papers you might consider or you might think that ESG is something that will uh, profoundly change uh, corporate culture uh, and save the world and save the environment. Uh, but uh, it, it's actually far uh, from from it. Uh, unfortunately, uh, ESG suffers from uh, a, a few fundamental problems, I would say. Uh, and you shouldn't consider this as as my critique towards ESG in a sense that we don't need ESG. Of course, we need ESG and ESG uh, at the end uh, is, is a very positive tool. Uh, uh, but there are certain uh, uh, fundamental problems that needs to be uh, addressed. Uh, and it, it might be good for you to uh, hear those problems right at the beginning so we can have a, a, a more meaningful uh, meaningful discussion. So as you can imagine, uh, ESG, so environment, social governance, uh, it, it's very wide. So you need to uh, you need to cover a very wide array of policies or mechanisms in order to quantify how a certain company uh, uh, relates to those criteria. So it's it's very difficult to have like a win-win situation. Of course, that would be perfect in a, in a in today's world, but it's very often necessary uh, 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 to do certain trade-offs. So if you want to be uh, good uh, in uh, environment, maybe you need a trade-off in in a social part or in government's uh, part. Uh, but the problem is that we have a huge uh, uh, amount of different kind of objectives and actually ESG as, uh, as a tool or as a method doesn't provide a coherent guide uh, for investors and companies how to do those trade-offs. So how, how to do uh, those trade-offs in order to have uh, the, the best possible score. Uh, one of the examples here is it's it's quite easy. For instance, everybody knows about Elon Musk. Everybody knows about Tesla. So uh, if you look at Tesla as a company, you would say uh, not you. I mean, <laughs> uh, general information uh, 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 is that Tesla is actually uh, a corporate governance nightmare. But on the other hand, uh, Tesla produces electric cars, uh, which is excellent because that way uh, we mitigate climate change. So uh, electric cars are excellent for the climate. On the other hand, uh, in the United States, we have a, 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 in currently it's a, a, a situation where we have closures of mining uh, jobs or mines, uh, which is actually good for the environment because uh, less coal, less pollution, less CO2 emissions. Uh, less impact on the climate change, but on the other hand, uh, it's quite awful for the workers that lose their job or uh, different kind of suppliers that lose uh, uh, their uh, business as well. Uh, so it's it's uh, very uh, uh, important to know that there are always some kind of uh, some kind of trade-offs uh, in this in this field. Another thing uh, here, which is quite problematic. Uh, is the issue of uh, incentives. Uh, uh, so uh, it's very typical, for instance, if you compare renewable energy sources and fossil fuels. So uh, we have a vast amount of uh, incentives in uh, domain of renewable energy sources, uh, which are transparent. Uh, but on the other hand, we have a large amount of incentives uh, in fossil fuels, which are not uh, very uh, transparent. So it's very difficult to assess all of those uh, indicators 
uh, and, and variables. Uh, very often, if a company is uh, is OK with having a stigma uh, that it's a big polluter uh, and uh, if it's OK for that for them to bear it, uh, then it's fine for them to uh, externalize their costs to the society uh, rather than paying them uh, for themselves. Uh, and finally, the third thing that uh, uh, is a bit problematic uh, uh, before we even start assessing ESG uh, is the measurement problem. So, uh, I mean, you uh, you probably all heard about uh, different uh, 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 rating companies, uh, uh, financial rating companies like uh, S and P, Moody's, uh, Fitch, etc. But if you look at companies across those rating agency, uh, they usually we have a you we usually have a correlation of like 99%. So if one company has a very good uh, 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 good uh, rate in in uh, S and P, uh, it's very improbable that it will have a junk level uh, in in uh, Moody's, for instance. So they, they very much correlate. Unfortunately, if you look at uh, ESG ratings, uh, uh, the, the situation is a little bit different. So we have a situation that uh, a certain company, depending on the rating agency and depending on the on the method or methodology, the difference can be uh, uh, even uh, fifty percent, which is uh, which is quite bad uh, for uh, uh, for the overall. Uh, for the overall system. Uh, so I didn't want you to, uh, uh, to, at the very beginning, I didn't want you to uh, uh, feel that this is something that will uh, change the world and save the planet, uh, but it's something that will probably get us there, but we need to solve certain issues and problems that we have with ESG. So let's try to do that and let's try to see uh, uh, what uh, what would be uh, those solutions? Uh, before we go into more details, let's try to demystify uh, the letters itself. So, social factors. Uh, social factors here are more or less defined uh, based on uh, SDG goals. Uh, they include human rights, labor standards, uh, community engagement, uh, but to be honest, I mean, if you uh, if you uh, look at like a very dynamic economy where uh, uh, a capitalistic dynamic economies, uh, then the private companies, private private firms uh, will basically structure their uh, social policies uh, and their social conduct in a way that they will pursue maximum profitability and maximal profits in the long run within the boundaries of the law. Of course, nobody will uh, will break the law, but this is what uh, uh, shareholders, uh, uh, companies will strive to. Of course, there are uh, there are some uh, uh, there are some uh, possible uh, possible uh, uh, exceptions. So, for instance, in tech, uh, in tech tech firms would uh, try to appeal to young employees uh, in order to attract the the best and the brightest people in order to to have the best talent uh, but this is not uh, a majority of cases there's no uh, one uh, let's say specific uh, specific template uh, which we can follow here uh, when it comes to human rights uh, the situation uh, is pretty much clear, at least from a uh, Western point of view. Uh, this is not uh, a debatable, uh, a, a fundamental aspects of social responsibilities. Uh, so, uh, of course, uh, it's it becomes very much controversial in the ESG concept when we have uh, multinational companies uh, that do business uh, in some other uh, in some other uh, parts of the world, like Asia, uh, Africa, uh, South America, because ESG, uh, in a sense, covers the whole 
uh, uh, it can cover the whole value chain. So value chain. So in that sense, uh, uh, these issues become very much important uh, in, in in those cases. Uh, when we talk about labor standards, here we do have uh, a, a wiggle room in a sense of uh, negotiating because. Uh, labor standards uh, are something that can be negotiable, especially uh, in uh, Western uh, uh, Western Hemisphere, where we have uni unionized uh, uh, concepts. Uh, in that case, uh, uh, basically, it comes down to uh, a market-driven system where uh, you have an example. Also, uh, again, tech companies will offer more. Uh, uh, more uh, benefits uh, in a form of uh, labor standards, uh, salaries, etc., uh, because it is it will be basically market uh, it will be basically market driven. Uh, and finally, uh, for the letter S, uh, what we have is the community engagement. Uh, this is very important for uh, situations uh, where we have. Uh, uh, industries or companies that are uh, very much geographically uh, structured. Uh, and in this case, uh, uh, this communication with the local community uh, is a key aspect uh, in this overall uh, ESG or S, uh, uh, S, rating, uh, S rating systems. Uh, of course, companies are committed they work to build positive relations with the local communities, uh, of course, within the boundaries of the law. Uh, and here, the the local government, so local regional uh, government or uh, policymakers, uh, are also very important in establishing uh, this interconnectivity between uh, the the companies uh, and the the local uh, community, uh, uh, informing this, let's say, community uh, community engagement. OK, uh, so let's go now uh, to the uh, uh, to the governance factors. Uh, so here <laughs> it's it's the governance or the management uh, is also very, uh, very, uh, 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 very complex and it's very difficult to capture all the complexity of some management procedures or a process in one uh, in one ticking box. So, for instance, we all more or less come from the Western Balkans. So we can uh, we can uh, very uh, uh, affirmatively say that we have uh, a very uh, structured uh, uh, or elaborate uh, governance codes in, for instance, our public companies like uh, uh, state-owned companies. But it's uh, I wouldn't say that uh, those companies has a very uh, high uh, uh, performance uh, in any way, so it's it's very difficult to uh, to tackle it. What does the governance factors uh, include? So they include the board diversity, executive compensation, uh, transparency in financial reporting, internal uh, incident risk management, uh, systematic risk management. Uh, here uh, we shouldn't mix that uh, with, let's say. Uh, uh, stakeholderism in, in, in a way. Uh, so our mission here is to disclose all the things that company uh, and uh, the users in a way or uh, 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 consumers in a way uh, turn a blind eye to basically. Uh, so this includes all the impacts companies uh, have, whether it's the environment, biodiversity, water scarcity, uh, whatever. Uh, and trying to uh, uh, trying to uh, materialize uh, those costs as external uh, external costs. So it doesn't uh, it's not altruism. It's actually uh, assessing regulatory uh, and uh, different kind of risks that might arise from this kind of let's say negative externalities. Here. This systematic risk management is also important from, let's say, uh, adaptation point of view, because here we are usually talking about mitigation. So how to mitigate, let's say, climate change, but also how to uh, uh, how to 
uh, 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 how to prepare for different kind of events that might happen because of climate change. So, for instance, in all of your countries, uh, you have uh, uh, state-owned uh, electricity utility companies like in Croatia, it's HEP, in uh, Serbia, it's Elektroprivreda. So, for instance, in uh, 10 or 20 years, uh, a lot of those electricity produced in those companies come from hydro, uh, hydropower plants. Uh, the water levels in the next 5, 10, 15 years will be much lower. So how to mitigate uh, those kind of risks through different kind of uh, governance uh, factors would be very uh, important for uh, this kind of uh, for this kind of companies. Uh, board diversity, this is quite, uh, uh, quite uh, 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 hot topic at least uh, in this part of the world, in let's say US and Western European countries, this is a very much uh, a, a, a normal thing, I would say. So representation of different groups on a company's board of directors. Uh, of course, companies that are committed to ESG will strive for diversity uh, of their boards in terms of gender, race, ethnicity, and other different uh, factors. Uh, Similar situation is with executive compensation. So this uh, inequality issue uh, that uh, that uh, arises from, let's say, uh, 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 different kind of uh, uh, different kind of companies or, or concepts that we uh, uh, meet today. Uh, companies that try to uh, implement ESG standards will try to ensure that executive compensation is fair and align with the company's uh, long-term goals. Uh, okay, uh, and finally, uh, what is very important here uh, is the transparency in the financial reporting, uh, which uh, it, it at the, right at this moment is very much uh, uh, controversial, both in the United States and the EU. Uh, so, for instance, uh, there's like uh, 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 I would say, uh, two different approaches in the United States and Europe. Uh, in the in the United States, currently the SEC, so Securities and Exchange Commission, uh, together with European Union and uh, 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 some regulators in Asia, they are actually trying uh, uh, or working towards standardizing disclosure on the climate change uh, risks. A certain company uh, faces. Uh, currently in the United States, SEC has proposed a rule uh, which would require big companies to address those issues, so to disclose climate-related risks uh, and greenhouse gas emissions for fiscal year, I think, uh, 2023. Of course, as you can probably imagine, this didn't uh, uh, go without a bank. So uh, there was a very big opposition on the Republican side currently at the United States. So uh, Republican lawmakers, attorney generals in uh, states that are under Republican uh, Republican control uh, are opposing this. Uh, and uh, currently the situation in the United States is that the whole issue will probably end up in different kind of uh, legislation or uh, legal uh, uh, legal legal conundrum, uh, so it's very difficult to to see what will happen. On the other hand, uh, uh, European Union is a little bit uh, uh, better. I mean, EU is a leader uh, when it comes to drafting different kind of environmental policies and laws. Uh, in January, so last month, actually. Uh, European Union has passed the ESRD uh, directive. It's Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, uh, which will oblige around 50,000 companies, including foreign ones that are working within uh, the EU, to disclose sustainability-related information uh, to their business models, strategies, supply chains, uh, so it, it's quite, I would say, revolutionized. Uh, and uh, the, the European Union expects to prepare uh, prepare new standards till, let's say, I think mid-2023. 
2023. Uh, so it will be very interesting to see what, what happens uh, uh, in this domain in the EU, because the, the directive itself uh, will uh, uh, will uh, basically uh, be uh, combined with the EU uh, new EU uh, taxonomy, uh, which sets uh, six criteria from climate change mitigation to protection on biodiversity. Uh, uh, so it, it will be very interesting to see uh, how it uh, uh, how it will uh, evolve, uh, especially this year, 2023. It will be very interesting to see what happens. OK, uh, let's go to letter E, so environmental factors. Uh, this <laughs> is also very wide. So if you can imagine, I mean, environment, uh, it includes climate change, uh, it, it includes uh, biodiversity, it includes um, uh, water scarcity. So it, it includes different kind of aspects, aspects uh, which all need to be uh, 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 need to be uh, quantified uh, in a way in order to establish uh, some kind of rating for an overall entity or for overall uh, company. Uh, to be honest, as me as an engineer, uh, but not me, but uh, if you look at different kind of literature, uh, books, uh, papers on the topic, uh, then uh, the key uh, the key issue here is actually emissions. So uh, very often when you read the uh, different kind of papers uh, on the topic, uh, very often uh, scholars would uh, basically call this E in ESG, uh, not environment, but emissions. Why? Because the emissions are those that have a global uh, impact. Uh, and basically uh, emissions are those that uh, uh, are the main and primary drivers uh, for climate change and reducing emissions uh, actually uh, by reducing emissions we tackle climate change uh, uh, the best uh, possible way and of course uh, uh, when it comes to emissions it's they're much uh, they're much easier to uh, to quantify because uh, there are, uh, we have procedures different kind of norms standards that we can use uh, in order for us to uh, uh, to to calculate all of those uh, all of those emissions. Uh, okay, so uh, let's see what we have under this environment part. So we definitely have uh, uh, climate change, uh, and that's why uh, knowing the emissions. Uh, means knowing which companies or which uh, uh, firms uh, pollute uh, more and which companies uh, uh, contribute to the climate change issue. But not only uh, contribute uh, at this point, but with uh, emissions and different kind of standards of tackling the emissions, you can actually monitor the progress of certain uh, companies uh, as they try to uh, as they try to uh, fix or decarbonize uh, uh, their uh, their operations. Uh, there are growing number of consumers and companies that uh, may choose uh, to use a product or a company uh, that is more sustainable or uh, emits less greenhouse gas emissions, even if their product uh, is uh, a bit more, uh, a bit more expensive. Uh, so, it's something that that needs to be uh, that needs to be uh, uh, tackled. So, companies that are committed to ESG will take steps into reducing their greenhouse gas emission, invert to renewable energy, uh, and work to mitigate the impacts of climate change on the communities where they operate. So, this is, I would say. Uh, what what is expected through uh, through their efforts within the ESG. Uh, second uh, second part uh, uh, of the environment uh, 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 dilemma is the biodiversity. Uh, so here uh, 
companies that are committed to uh, ESG will work to prote protect biodiversity by preserving natural habitats, reducing pollution and minimizing their impacts uh, 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 on the uh, ecosystem. Uh, but make no mistake, uh, basically uh, what is necessary, especially when it comes to biodiversity, what we can see on the EU level through uh, uh, through uh, different directives such as uh, renew uh, recast of renewable energy sources directive, etc., is tougher government action uh, because it cannot only uh, stay on the company level. We definitely need different kind of policies that uh, should be implemented in order to achieve, for instance. Uh, issues regarding uh, uh, bio uh, biodiversity. Uh, for instance, one of the uh, one of the uh, uh, one of the things that uh, uh, is probably the most popular mechanism of lowering CO2 emissions uh, is different kind of uh, 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 CO2 uh, pricing schemes. Uh, at this point, uh, we can uh, uh, there's all there's more than one fifth of all global emissions uh, are under some kind of uh, pricing schemes. Uh, it's about a double the level of five years ago, which is a very, uh, a very big, uh, big step uh, forward. OK, so uh, now when we understand what ESG is, what does it represent? Uh, when we understand what are the limitations uh, of the ESG, uh, the final, uh, the final uh, uh, thing that we need to discuss is actually the rating itself. Okay, so uh, when it comes to uh, scores or rating scores of the ESG, we have two possibilities. So we have uh, this uh, quantitative approach where you collect different kind of data, different kind of information, numerical data. Uh, you analyze them, you assign different kind of scores, ratings to the company, etc. Uh, and the other uh, possibility is to have a qualitative approach, uh, which is OK in certain occasions where it's very difficult to uh, acquire uh, numerical data or collect systematically data. So here you have uh, different kind of questionnaires, interviews, external sources. Uh, in this case, the results may be a little bit more opti uh, a little bit more uh, subjective than in this uh, classical, uh, let's say, uh, quantitative uh, uh, quantitative uh, approach. But let's uh, let's uh, try to stay a little bit more on this uh, EAG, uh, ESG rating uh, scheme. Measuring, in this case, let's say, measuring carbon emissions is critical. Uh, in order for us to fight uh, climate change or do uh, uh, any kind of uh, uh, any kind of uh, uh, climate change mitigation, because uh, within this scheme of measuring, we can do different kind of uh, carbon policies uh, in place, which at the end will mean that high emitters will be penalized by the market uh, at some. Uh, 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 at some uh, sense, and it will allow uh, all the companies uh, on the market uh, to evaluate their position and to streamline towards uh, uh, a better uh, or a lower uh, emissions uh, uh, within their company. Uh, with it, with emissions, it's more or less straightforward. You have this tier one, tier two, tier three, or uh, let's say uh, uh, scope one, scope two, scope three. So scope one or tier one uh, are all the emissions uh, from a company's day-to-day -day operations. Tier two emissions are the ones that uh, uh, are from energy suppliers, uh, such as electricity companies. And then we have a problem with tier three uh, because they are the the most uh, tricky ones to to determine because. Uh, they cover the whole value chain from extraction of raw materials uh, through suppliers to end users, users, and they can account to even as much as 90% uh, of emissions in certain uh, uh, type of uh, uh, a certain type of 
uh, industries. Here, it's uh, one of the things that is very uh, tricky is uh, responsibilities and overlaps. So uh, who is responsible for certain emissions? So if you have uh, a car that runs on petrol, uh, should an oil company be blamed for emissions when its fuels is burned in internal combustion engine? Or is it uh, uh, a car company or someone else? Or they are both, they are both uh, responsible. So it's very uh, uh, tricky to determine different kind of uh, boundaries of the system that you're trying to uh, trying to uh, uh, trying to uh, analyze. Uh, the the colleagues, uh, 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 the the researchers from MIT call it uh, uh, aggregate confusion uh, because uh, it's very difficult to determine uh, which criteria uh, is more important. Uh, and which criteria uh, is better? Uh, uh, which criteria is better uh, for uh, 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 for a certain uh, uh, criteria? Sorry. Uh, so I can give you an example. Very, uh, very, uh, very uh, easy. Different kind of rating companies uh, for ESG uh, will have different scope measurement and different kind of weighing system on a certain uh, on a certain uh, policy. So some uh, rating uh, 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 agencies will not uh, use uh, uh, something that another one uses. So for instance, one rating agency will include uh, corporate lobbying activities in their assessment and another agency uh, will not. So it's it's something totally uh, 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 totally, uh, totally different, we, and it's very difficult to compare this kind of rating systems. They also measure differently the same thing. It's also problematic. Uh, uh, for instance, one rating agency uh, will assess labor practices based on, I don't know, uh, employee turnover. Uh, and another uh, uh, count, uh, another rating agency will count uh, labor-related uh, court cases against the firm. So something totally different, and each one will assign uh, some kind of uh, uh, numerical factor uh, uh, on this. So they will uh, assign different kind of weighing points or ponders, uh, 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 putting more emphasis on one or putting more emphasis uh, on uh, or uh, putting more emphasis uh, on another, uh, but I didn't. I don't want uh, to end this lecture uh, by you thinking ESG is bad and it shouldn't be done. Uh, quite contrary, ESG is good. It's an excellent step towards sustainability. Uh, it's excellent step towards decarbonization of uh, companies and industry. Uh, it just needs uh, more fine tuning regarding methods, methodology, uh, legal procedures, uh, uh, government, uh, uh, government uh, 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 incentives and uh, uh, legal framework that will fine tune all the things that are maybe a little bit, uh, a little bit problematic. So the value of an ESG program is great it's huge it really means greater uh, greater uh, profitability so there's a strong correlation between better esg risk management and higher profitability uh, and basically a large amount of investment investors but individual consumers uh, are slowly starting to pass on companies that cannot demonstrate a commitment to address ESG uh, uh, ESG issues. Improved cost of capital and employee retention is also uh, very interesting as a result of uh, uh, of ESG. So for instance, I can I can tell you the 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 the, the numbers. So according to Barron's in 2020, so ESG stocks outperformed the stock market by 46% in US, by 20% in Europe, and by 77% in Asia. Uh, 
So according to BlackRock's first global client sustainable invest in investment investing survey, uh, 23 billion was investment was invested in ESG uh, in 2020, compared to only 450 million in 2019. Dow Jones uh, also noted that investment uh, flowing into ESG fund was uh, up 102 percent in 2020 compared to uh, uh, 2019. Uh, second thing. Uh, second thing, uh, 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 another benefits here is the regulatory compliance. So what what does it mean? Uh, uh, I mean, many ESG related laws and uh, regulations are already in place, uh, especially in, in energy uh, and environmental intensive industries. So, for instance, if you look at the uh, European Union, it has implemented the best and the biggest currently best and the biggest uh, emission trading system ETS, where companies uh, are uh, trading their uh, CO2 uh, CO2 credits, and they are trying to uh, they are trying to mitigate their uh, CO2 emissions because they would need less CO2 allowances bought on an open market. And I can tell you that uh, a few years ago uh, we were all thinking uh, the price of CO2 will never go up to 50, 60 or 70 euros per a ton. Uh, in 2015-16 when we were doing a, a low carbon strategy for Croatia, the the projections were, were 100 euros per a ton of CO2 in 2050. But I can tell you the CO2 price went to uh, 85 to 90 euros uh, per a town uh, uh, last year. So uh, things change quite rapidly uh, in in uh, in this domain. So another thing is improved resource management and sustainability, mitigate financial material risks. So companies that are focused on uh, ESG, they see benefits in efficiency and cost reduction. This is what we can see from different kind of literature review, papers, uh, journals, etc. These efficiencies basically occur uh, thanks to more efficient resource allocation, employee retention, and avoiding uh, regulatory non-compliance issues. One of the examples is, is uh, let's say, transportation cost within, uh, let's say, a multinational uh, multinational company. Uh, OK, we're OK with time. Uh, so let's uh, let's uh, try to uh, let's try to see uh, what are the steps in development of action plan for improvement of uh, ESG uh, ESG criteria. Uh, I don't know if any of you had any kind of experience with uh, uh, ISO norms related to energy or environment like 50,001 or 14,000. Uh, they are more or less similar in a way that uh, we try to assess the baseline. So what is the current state regarding emissions, social governance, etc.? Uh, where do we want to go? Uh, and then we evaluate and we assess different kind of steps how to reach that goal. And then uh, try to assess whether these steps or these measures that we implement on a company level did they uh, uh, did they reach those targets goals that we thought they would reach? If yes, then excellent. The the policy and the implementation policy was great. We have improved our sorry. Uh, we have improved our ESG score. If not. Let's try to re-evaluate re uh, our uh, uh, incentives and policies regarding uh, our ESG, and le let's implement new ones and see whether they bring uh, bring us to some uh, better uh, ESG scoring. Uh, uh, uh. So the first step is to conduct a current versus future state of assessments. So identify where the business is now, where we want to go. Uh, and basically here, uh, important 
uh, thing or important exercise is to focus uh, on the materiality uh, uh, assessment. This will help stakeholders prioritize what ESG metrics are uh, impacting uh, your scoring system or your business uh, uh, and which are not. Here, the ideal uh, outcome uh, of this first step would be a better understanding of material issues and a strategic ro roadmap put in place on a company level. The second step is defining program scope for the next uh, one year, two years, and who needs to be uh, who needs to be involved. Well, stakeholders involved in sustainability, supply chain, human resources, different kind of investor relations uh, are the main com contributors. Uh, 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 contributors here. And here the ideal outcome uh, is some kind of internal subject uh, uh, experts identified, uh, different kind of committees, uh, committees form, uh, formed, uh, etc. The third step is to select communication plan for internal and public progress, including disclosure and reporting. Uh, so here, determine which reporting methods will best fit internal needs and external communication uh, communication uh, plan. So what do you need to consider here, actually? What does business, uh, uh, th does the business uh, face any kind of special regulatory requirements? What material factors are the most relevant in the industry? Uh, what will help address risk and find opportunities? So these these are the type of questions that you would uh, want to uh, stress out here. And the ide ideal outcome would be specific reporting metrics and uh, guidelines established with executive buy-ins. Fourth step is establish repeatable workflow and an ESG uh, measures database. This is... Uh, crucial. This is uh, arguably the the most important step uh, uh, and the best opportunity an ESG team has for creating a program that is streamlined and it's very easily, uh, uh, easily uh, maintained. Uh, because ESG reporting requires multiple contributors, so from different kind of departments, different kind of uh, levels uh, uh, of the companies, and they all need to submit specific uh, data uh, to fulfill reports and assessments. So uh, streamlining that uh, and having uh, some kind of repeatable workflow is a critical uh, thing here. Here, ideal outcome is data collection uh, assignments, repetitive uh, workflow automation, and a single source of truth let's say, uh, established at the company uh, at the company level. Uh, and the fi final two, two steps uh, uh, in order to develop and implement the ESG is report results uh, regular to regularly and benchmarking, uh, benchmarking uh, the trend. Well, here, I mean, instead of relying uh, on uh, different kind of uh, yearly uh, sustainability or corporate responsibility reports, which are usually very uh, intensive, uh, here ESG data can be uh, uh, can be assessed very uh, easily at a glance on different kind of snapshots or uh, dashboards. Uh, this approach allows all the different stakeholders uh, uh, the information they need at the exact time uh, when they uh, uh, when they need it. So here, uh, ideal outcome is data is cons uh, consol consolidated uh, with clear charts and dashboards available uh, uh, to easily uh, update. And finally, uh, plan for uh, actionable improvement uh, uh, here. Uh, as such, a cycle of workflow, uh, planning, improving and reporting is integrated across departments and is uh, consolidated to satisfy all stakeholders, uh, such as uh, customers, investors, regulators, and most importantly, the board uh, of uh, directors. Uh, here, ideal outcome is the fact that ESG becomes more than an ad hoc or once a year manual reporting exercise, 
but it's actually an ongoing process of continually, continuously uh, updating uh, and improving uh, your uh, company on all three levels. So environment, social uh, and uh, governance. OK, uh, I think I'm OK with time, maybe a little bit more than than I had, uh, but uh, here I would stop this first part that was more or less uh, a little bit uh, technical, but I just wanted you to know a bit more from the technical side on ESG, uh, what it stands for, what are the critical issues uh, regarding uh, ESG. Uh, and now I will just uh, check uh, on the chat. Uh, just a second. If we have uh, some uh, questions. Uh, OK. OK, a lot of questions. OK, let's start uh, uh, from the uh, from the beginning. Uh, OK, uh, Militsa, uh, what do you think about? Uh, to be honest, I have no uh, I have no uh, experience or any uh, uh, um, any uh, reach uh, regarding impact, but there are different kind of uh, uh, different kind of uh, initiatives like this uh, around. Uh, so uh, it's very difficult to have like uh, a more uh, specific answer without. Uh, investigating uh, a little bit, uh, a little bit more. But uh, there are different kind of uh, different kind of uh, companies like uh, like Impact uh, uh, around. So I don't know. It's 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 difficult to say uh, any more more than that. Uh, Mladen Ličković, is there any standard among EU financial institutions about mandatory ESG criteria? needed for. I heard that uh, has similar criteria. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, OK, uh, to be honest, uh, uh, one of the things that uh, uh, that the new directive uh, should solve is actually uh, in line uh, uh, in line uh, with your uh, questions, because during mid 2023 we should have some new standards uh, uh driven from the uh, from the ESRD directive uh so we'll see what happens uh from my side uh, we have been involved uh in some uh, local initiatives uh that were actually started by uh, banks uh that are trying to assess this criteria uh internally so this is something banks do uh, uh, in the last uh, uh, in the last few years, because the pressure uh, of this, let's say, environmental uh, impacts regarding companies and investing is is quite uh, quite important. Uh, policies, Dobrila uh, policies and infrastructure to help uh, transfer. Uh, well, uh, you have different kind of uh, different kind of uh, institutions that uh, do the ratings, but you also have different kind of institution and companies that might be, uh, let's say, a consultants in the process of different kind of ESG implementation. It's similar to uh, different kind of ISO norm uh, that you want to implement. You always have some kind of consultancy that are helping you uh, implement uh, different kind of procedures within your company. So uh, a, a company by itself, uh, I, I'm not so sure that the company by itself can do it without any kind of external help uh, or any kind of consultancy uh, services. Uh, is it applicable in uh, non-profit sector? Do we have some uh, examples, criteria? It's, it's, uh, OK. Uh, uh, Based on what I've seen, what I've seen uh, until today, uh, all the all the 
lit not all, but vast majority uh, uh, of ESG uh, is within a private uh, a private sector, uh, uh, and most of it is done in the private sector. Uh, if I remember correctly, there are some examples uh, using ESG uh, for non-profit uh, uh, and uh, non-governmental. I haven't seen uh, uh, I haven't seen uh, uh, examples, but I did see articles uh, and papers where it was mentioned as uh, as something that is done. Uh, no, uh, so uh, Angela, uh, no, uh, ESG is not, not a program like, uh, I mean, life cycle assessment is also not a program. It's you have different kind of softwares uh, that uh, allows you to uh, do LCA for a certain product, technology, etc. Uh, situation here is is the same. There, there's no, uh, 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 there's no uh, ESG is not a program. It's it's a methodology that that you use to do a different kind of assessment. Uh, in Macedonia, we do not pay for emissions of CO2 yet. Uh, yes, you are uh, not in ETS uh, yet, but uh, European Union is preparing with CBAM uh, mechanisms that would allow uh, EU to do some kind of taxation uh, on all the products uh, that are produced outside of the European Union, where different kind of uh, external externalities uh, are not paid or not uh, uh, covered. Uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, uh, as well, so BH is still not uh, in ETS. That's why it's very, uh, very profitable to produce electricity in Bosnia and Herzegovina from coal because you don't have to pay for uh, CO2 emissions and you can export the electricity to to Croatia. OK. Uh, uh, OK, uh, next question. Uh, 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 just a second. Uh, next question in this one. Where? Okay. Uh, 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 uh. Tell us more about. Uh -huh, okay, Sonia. Uh, tell us more about international reporting standards and framework that is used for uh, ESG disclosure. And something more about uh, uh, the ESG audits. Well, ba basically, it's it's uh, a more or less. Uh, the the short uh, overview of the the logics or the methodology uh, is done uh, is done in uh, in the last few slides where we talk about steps how to implement the methodology uh, when it comes to uh, reporting standards uh, basically it it's a cross or it's a cross or a, uh, overlay of different kind of uh, standards that you might be uh, implementing so for instance uh, your company might already have an implemented uh, energy management system, ISO energy management system. They more already have implemented uh, different kind of uh, different kind of uh, environmental uh, ISO norm systems. Your company may already have a gender uh, uh, a gender uh, balance uh, plan uh, implemented in the company. Your company may already have. Uh, uh, different kind of uh, uh, different kind of uh, other internal procedures uh, that all have some uh, uh, some impacts on uh, both environmental, uh, social, or or government's uh, government's procedure. So uh, you can you you you're not uh, excluded uh, from using any kind of norms uh, or standards. Uh, uh, implementing in your company. So, for instance, some companies already are in ETS, so it means all of their emissions are accounted for. So they already have a database, so they know exactly how much uh, uh, how much uh, CO2 they are uh, uh, emitting. So basically, you have numerous standards 
that you can uh, that you can uh, 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 enforce within your company in order to evaluate different aspects of uh, of uh, uh, ESG. For instance, I mean, if you're in Croatia and uh, uh, legally as a big company, you need to have an energy audit in place every four years and you have a, a government already has uh, a bylaw that defines you how to implement an energy audit in your company or it requires you to implement ISO 50001 as an alternative. So all of those policies as me and measures are more or less in line with uh, uh, ESG and will be used in order to evaluate uh, uh, evaluate uh, uh, your uh, ESG. Uh, okay. Uh, currently in Macedonia, we uh, okay. Uh, okay, introducing the bomb uh, is planned in 2026. The bomb is starting in October, but will okay. For non EU, okay. For now, the general, okay. Milica, okay. Okay, I think uh, I think I'm 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 done. Ah, oh, one more question. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, one more question. Uh, uh, period. Oh. Just a second, I, I lost it. Ah, no, these are uh, these are the Tsebam uh, Beha Tsebam October. Uh, ah, okay. Uh, finally, uh, Gri. Ha. Uh, what about uh, what about Gri standards and uh, Smeta audit? Uh, well, I mean, it's it's another. Uh, I mean, it, it's another standard that uh, enable any organization uh, to understand and report on their impacts on the economy, environment, and people. Uh, so it's it's uh, another another tool uh, that you might use uh, in establishing uh, whether it's a large or small company uh, to uh, report on impacts on economy, environment. Uh, uh, so it's it's another uh, it's another it's another standard that that can be used for that. Uh, okay, uh, I think. Uh, oh, okay, I, I'm way over my my time since I had to finish at uh, 19:45. Now it's uh, quarter. Uh, now it's eight. So uh, thank you very much. I'm leaving you with uh, Adela. Uh, she will continue with uh, uh, this, let's say, communication part, and then Anna will uh, will uh, uh, finalize with uh, task uh, for this uh, weekend. So thank you very much for for the attention, and I think we see each other uh, next week as well. So okay. Thank you, Tomislav. Uh, hi everyone. Thanks for your, your attention so far. So um, Tomislav was uh, went through uh, all the various aspects of ESG from both a positive and a, and let's say a more negative uh, connotation. And I will do the same, but I will be a little bit more critical than he was uh, with regards to what ESG means right now, what it could potentially mean, and what are the constraints in the current and the future, uh, let's say, uh, a global context. Uh, so the title of the second part of this uh, lecture is Environmental Social Greenwashing. Uh, and I will try to be quick so that we have uh, more time for questions afterwards. So uh, as it was already said in the beginning, ESG has uh, emerged from, let's say, uh, being a relatively niche concept uh, in the sidelines of 
industry to being a more of a mainstream concept. And if any of you opens LinkedIn, you will be able to see that most of the major companies, not only, uh, let's say, uh, uh, not only major companies, but also medium and small companies are starting to have ESG departments, or at least they have a person that is responsible for ESG reporting. And this is uh, either someone who obtained new qualifications in ESG or they just transferred the person from who was up until now responsible for corporate social responsibility uh, to uh, ESG. And usually they would sit somewhere in between, let's say, the PR communications department and the legal department, or they would be within the PR communications department. Uh, I mean, uh, this is obviously a, a generalization. Just to make the point that uh, ESG has a um, has an important PR and communications aspect to it, and it, this communications and PR aspect to it does not necessarily correspond to the greening of the company that it represents. Often, more often than not, I would argue in the next slides, it corresponds to the greenwashing of companies rather than to their greening. So. Uh, but obviously we have, uh, um, as a result of the emergence and the popularization of ESG uh, in the corporate world, uh, we have now uh, the surfacing of numerous um, ESG data. And you, th this was actually made obvious in the questions that you posed because there are all these various companies that conduct uh, that com conduct metrics and that provide various criteria for assessing ESG, uh, and that can be quite confusing. Um, uh, but the main question that I'm asking uh, as part of this presentation, and I'm asking you, is whether this increase and in, let's say overinflation of ESG data does that uh, does that actually uh, mean that we're seeing any positive change in relation to companies' performance and in relation to these environmental, social governance aspects that companies should be reporting about as part of their ESG uh, reporting standards. So, uh, does ESG actually have an impact on influencing corporate behavior? That's the key question or it has an impact only on their PR and the way they communicate about how they're supposedly green. Um, we can move to the next uh, slide, Anna, please. So, uh, so that in the first part, I will be looking at, let's say, more from, from a more skeptical angle uh, at uh, how and why and uh, in which circumstances ESG contributes to the greenwashing of companies. So what do we mean by the greenwashing of companies uh, through the use of ESG? We mean that companies publish huge quantities of data, but this does not correspond to their performance, uh, positive performance in relation to the real aspects that the ESG is supposed to measure. Uh, so, um, and we can see this in in, uh, uh, in in specific empirical examples. So, uh, I will just read out a couple of examples, which are very recent. A recent survey from Google Cloud. Uh, in a recent survey from Google Cloud, 80% of nearly 1,500 executives from six, 16 countries claimed that the organization was above average for environmental uh, sustainability, but only 36% of the respondents said that their organizations have measurement tools to quantify their sustainability efforts, and only 17% use these to optimize their efforts. So their self-perception about how sustainable they are, or the, the perception that there's the, the, the image that they are trying to project to the public is a lot more optimistic and, and in, it's in, in many ways discrepant to the real measures and metrics that they are applying within the company itself. Several examples. Recently, German authorities raided Deutsche Bank because uh, of uh, allegations that they uh, greenwashed their data on ESG. U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission fined the management arm of uh, the Bank of New York for misleading claims also in relation to uh, greenwashing. 
most uh, again a recent example from this past week Shell PLC was accused, uh, again also by the Securities and Exchange Commission, for overstating and inf inflating the uh, um, extent, the content of its renewables and energy solutions portfolio. Another example, uh, FIFA uh, is now being uh, investigated by the Belgian Advertising Ethics Panel over claims that painting the 2022 World Cup in Qatar as carbon neutral was deceptive and aimed at greenwashing um, the World Cup. Uh, and these are just a couple of very recent examples. Um, and uh, these are not exceptions. Companies like Coca-Cola, ExxonMobil, Nestle um, are, are being, um, uh, all are being investigated for alleged decep deceptions in the climate aspects of their business practices. Uh, and this also uh, is reflected in the perceptions amongst the consumers, amongst the common people. Uh, a recent survey found that 67% of consumers, uh, of global consumers, believe that their financial institutions in particular are guilty of greenwashing. So when we, when we uh, observe, uh, observe this, we need to be, let's say, uh, we need to see it from a, from a more nuanced perspective. We have companies uh, that do it deliberately with the intention of uh, deceiving, but also companies do it because of they don't really understand, they don't have the capacity uh, internally to deliver on these various metrics that are required by ESG. So uh, there is, it can be argued that part of the reason why we end up with greenwashing in certain cases that, is that um, there is lack of knowledge about what constitutes uh, authentic, accurate, and identifiable green credentials, or that can be said to be an excuse. Uh, in any case, there are these two extremes. So, um, uh, how does greenwashing happen? Uh, it happens uh, basically, as I, as I said at the outset of this uh, presentation, that uh, it influences corporate communications, PR, but it doesn't influence corporate behavior. So you would see reports written by usually um, the, the same people that would be responsible for the corporate communications, the PR, the corporate social responsibility in a very nicely way designed uh, forms and graphs and uh, metrics. And they would publicize this with, you know, press releases, and then there would be Shell is uh, making headways in terms of their renewable energy portfolio. But in in fact, in effect, um, that doesn't mean that they have changed their corporate behavior, or not in the ways that are necessary to to be changed to have any meaningful impact on a social scale or on a, or on an environmental scale. So, what are the different ways in which um, greenwashing? takes place. Uh, first of all, is uh, this is done by uh, reporting activities instead of outcomes. So most of the ESG metrics that are currently available are reporting activities, not outcomes. And when we when I when I talk about activities rather than outcomes, I mean inputs like policies, principles, management systems, targets and disclosures. So they would say uh, the company put in place um, um, uh, an entire HR department that would be looking at, uh, let's say, labor practices, or they have now a mental health uh, section that, that is looking at uh, improving the mental health among employees, or there is, um, uh, or, or there is some sort of a, a, a social program looking to improve their green output in a specific community. Uh, but without actually checking the outcomes and how they measure against other negative externalities that that company might have. So this is one aspect of how uh, greenwashing happens. So you report activities and not outcomes. Part of the reason, again, is because it is quite complicated to how do you define outcomes, how do you measure it, how do you track it against time. The second way is uh, to manipulate disclosures, manipulating the metrics. So you would overemphasize the positive. So you, uh, if there is, a, let's say we're talking about um, uh, a fossil fuel company, and then they would talk about how they invested a lot in, in terms of uh, COVID-19 mitigation at their gas stations. Uh, but then they wouldn't talk uh, at all about the, their CO2 emissions. So they would 
create all these graphs as part of their ESG report, and then they would completely sideline all the negative aspects. And then uh, that would hide from view uh, the real picture about the real impact socially, environmentally, uh, and more globally of that company. Uh, then there is, a, as it was mentioned by Tomislav, there is the more methodological issue. How do you compare between the various aspects? How do you rate the impact between environmental social governance? Be you know, in, at, in the gov environmental, we have the climate change impact, the various environmental impacts, emissions. In the social, you have the labor uh, aspect, other aspects. In the governance, you have, let's say, uh, ethnic diversity, um, gender diversity uh, within company boards, how do you evaluate which one, one against the other? Uh, what are the ways in which you, you can uh, compare and contrast which one is more important and how one offsets the other, let's say. So this is a real methodological challenge. Um, another issue, and this was also uh, uh, somewhat posed as a, as a question in the chat, there is a, a lack of transparency, standardization, and um, consolidation of, of ESG as a report, reporting industry as a whole. So we have numerous companies across the world that make uh, ESG ratings. They have different metrics, and often they actually clash. They're contradictory. Tomislav also mentioned this. You would find one company to be faring to be scoring uh, very low uh, in terms of, let's say, the ratings of Bloomberg ESG disclosure, and then a rating very high in terms of the sustainability industry rank, because they have different methodologies and they're looking at different things. Um, then another uh, uh, thing that contributes to greenwashing is that most of the data is actually extracted, whether it is quantitative or qualitative. It is extracted from companies' voluntary, mostly unaudited disclosures. So they are the ones that publish tra transparently, if they do, and these are usually publicly listed companies that would publish on their websites. They would publish uh, their rate, uh, data in terms and tables about uh, 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 how they fared in terms of the various uh, environmental, social, and governance aspects of ESG. And they would choose, pick and choose, cherry pick, which are the various aspects they would report on. Um, and uh, there is no, actually right now, th there is this attempt by the European Union to have this directive that tries to standardize uh, the measurement procedures. But right now, uh, there isn't such a globally accepted or even regionally accepted way of, uh, of auditing disclosures and tracking uh, responses uh, and quantifying, uh, quantifying them uh, in, in relation to reality. Finally, there is uh, another, uh, another issue that leads to greenwashing is that there is a bias. So ESG ratings tend to be skewed uh, to portray a more sort of positive image of larger companies uh, in comparison to smaller companies. And why is this the case? Because larger companies have more money to invest in, in departments of, uh, on ESG that with experts, let's say, that come uh, uh, from, uh, that studied environmental communications or that come in some way from the NGO civil society sector and that have a better understanding of how to present the data. And, uh, and then this creates the image, uh, the, the PR aspect is covered, but the behavior change is not covered. So uh, that, is another, uh, that is another aspect that um, leads to greenwashing. And finally, um, another thing to be borne in mind is that there is uh, a, the potential and sometimes uh, 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 there is the potential, and sometimes this already, this has in fact already happened in many cases. There can be a conflict of interest between ESG rating providers and companies, and often companies that have a high stake in uh, presenting themselves as uh, as uh, confirming to ESG standards. They have a, and usually these are very large and powerful companies with large financial uh, financial power, they would buy off ESG rating companies and then this creates a conflict of interest in terms of how they rate the companies that actually stand behind them. Uh, now, uh, why would companies try to 
greenwashed, let's say, their portfolio in terms of ESG. Uh, first of all, uh, there are trends. Uh, th there is a growing trend towards sustainability. So from a PR and communications perspective, it makes sense. Uh, and I will talk a little bit more later on in the second part about how it influences um, in certain way their uh, consumption patterns of their consumers. So there are market pressures and incentives to be uh, seen as a green company and not necessarily to be a green, com green company. And then uh, another reason why they greenwash is because of regulatory pressure. Um, uh, as it was mentioned by Tomislav, we have this EU Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, which would require 50,000 additional companies uh, to comply with ESG requirements. And this is expected to put pressure for standardizing the criteria, but it remains to be seen. Uh, and I am personally skeptical whether an institution from, let's say, an EU level institution will be able to discipline large companies or whether there will be again uh, back and forth uh, conflict of interest going on and uh, a pushback against uh, too much of an influence from the directive. And finally, uh, greenwashing, why does it happen by some companies? Because some companies uh, are inherently the products and services which they produce and the, uh, the business model which they rely on are inherently negative so they they cannot uh, be improved be, uh, because they have inherently negative characteristics and any positive Im impacts from their products or their company's esg are trivial in comparison to the negative impact impact that they have so now the next slide are two examples of you know this is uh, these are examples from here from macedonia locally uh, as a sort of to trigger a little bit of a discussion afterwards um, one is the example of um, a, a factory that produces cement and is considered to be one of the biggest polluters in Skopje. And they donate, donated uh, a new facade of a new primary school in a, uh, in a, in a neighborhood in Skopje. Uh, and now the donation could be seen as one of their, let's say, social community engagement aspects. And then how does this fare against their um, larger environmental impact on a, on a, on a, on a city level uh, with all its uh, health and social, uh, socially negative uh, and politically negative uh, consequences. Is this a company that can, uh, through better ESG reporting, improve, uh, improve its, uh, let's say, business model or its products or its services? Or is it a company that inherently just by the way of uh, uh, the way in which it produces profit in a specific location that there is no way of actually uh, uh, turning it into greening it, let's say. And the other example is less extreme. It's uh, the, the, the example is uh, uh, what it says is a, 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 a small move for a large change. Uh, several months ago, maybe even a year ago, of supermarkets and even gas stations started introducing uh, paper bags and gas stations did the same. So not only Mac Petrol, but also other gas stations, Okta, other uh, did the same. And they will report this afterwards in their corporate social responsibility because not yet companies in the region at least don't yet call um, their ESG reports, ESG reports. They still use, let's say, the little bit outdated terminology of corporate social responsibility. But anyhow, uh, in their annual reports, they will still report this as how they contributed to the environment, how they contributed to, uh, let's say, social, environmental, uh, how they had a positive social environment, environmental impact. But how does that fare in relation to them being a fossil fuel, uh, let's say, company and uh, their overall environmental impact? How do we how do we uh, rate between the two? Uh, OK, we can go to the next slide. So uh, in the previous, uh, you can go, you can move back one slide. 
So in the previous section, I was uh, looking at, let's say, the more, uh, what does it mean for companies to greenwash their ESG? And uh, now the next uh, part, we'll be looking at the greening of companies. Does, uh, under which circumstances would ESG be actually contributing or might have the potential to lead to the greening of companies? So what would that mean actually for ESG to be contributing, contributing to the greening of companies? First of all, it would mean that uh, we have transparent, scalable and comparable measurement of uh, environmental and social impacts, which is uh, able to influence uh, corporate behavior. So uh, we will, uh, in an ideal scenario, we would have rankings that portray a, a, a picture which is the closest to reality. And in turn, this influences how consumers uh, uh, view this corporation or company, and then it turn in, in in turn this uh, um, influences their consumer behavior, uh, and then this changes the incentives for the corporation or the company, and this can lead to a change in behavior because it it can influence their uh, market performance. They will start losing, uh, they will start losing customers. So uh, when customers change their purchasing based on ESG metrics, uh, suppliers might start to change behavior or only those suppliers that have a direct, uh, let's say, feel the direct consequence of this would change the behavior. Uh, um, however, there is a the, the disclaimer to this is that um, ESG standards or um, applying ESG standards are not always complementary to profits. Oftentimes, uh, applying ESG standards extremely and radically means that the company itself becomes less competitive. It offers a more, let's say, expensive product, and in a certain context, let's say, of um, uh, of a more of, of a lower purchasing parity, of a more purchasing power in certain societies like ours, that would mean company the company phases itself out from the market. And in a capitalist environment, what where profit is the main rationale, that would mean that leaves little, uh, you know, ground for ESG really uh, driving all of the behavior on the market. So if the whole industry acts together, it would be possible. But if a single firm is acting on its own, it puts it at its comparative disadvantage. Um, so, but anyhow, um, transparency and better reporting and. Uh, uh, let's say more consistent and more uh, uh, and better audited evaluations uh, would, in any case, uh, for certain companies that are able to make the case uh, and present it to their uh, consumers, uh, can have a, a positive impact on their business model as well. Let's uh, go to the next slide. Next slide, please. So. Anna, next slide. So these are um, these are reports uh, on consumer trends from uh, from the Stylus platform, which which is used by marketing companies, and it is looking at uh, trends organized by different uh, generations, like Boomers, Generation Z, Millennials. Generation Alpha, and uh, in in a lot of these reports, what's visible is that, uh, especially amongst let's say Generation Z, sustainability um, uh, the sustainability aspect of a company, let's say Booking.com or design companies, plays a role in their <clears throat> in their consumption patterns. So. For companies that are able to uh, integrate sustainability in their business models, th this can mean an extra uh, extra selling point that they can then present as part of their PR strategies that they can use as part of their uh, as one of their selling points. So uh, that's why, in that way, uh, ESG. Uh, let's say if if it reports that companies are more sustainable, it can translate into uh, into uh, more sustainable, uh, let's say, uh, practices, but this is not driven by, it wouldn't be primarily driven by sustainability, it would be, again, driven by 
profitability uh, incentives by companies that are adapting to the uh, new uh, demands of, of their consumers, of their market. Um, next slide. And that, of course, depends on uh, there being a good match between uh, uh, what companies say uh, that they're doing as part of their ESG ratings and metrics and what uh, is actually the case, well, how the company uh, is actually performing in real life, in, in the real world, what impact it has socially, environmentally in terms of governance. Now, interestingly, uh, Companies that are uh, responsible for ESG reporting are growing themselves. There is a sector itself. Companies that uh, uh, that are responsible for ESG reporting are, are a sector in themselves that is uh, booming. So ESG fintech uh, activity grew six, 46% in 2022 to hit a new world, uh, a new record. Uh, the first company on the list uh, Descartes Underwriting is an insurance provider that builds re resilience against climate risk. And it was the largest ESG fintech deal in 2022, raising $120 million in their latest Series B funding round. So uh, uh, what that tells us is that the company that actually uh, functions not only as a, as a way of reporting to the consumers, but actually uses the ESG metric as a way of, uh, as, a, as let's say, a, a risk management tool. So uh, considers exposure to climate change risks as various liabilities uh, and is able to track against this, uh, is able to make a lot of profit based on s selling its tool. But there are all these other companies, let's say, Tricard, Ecolytic, you can have a look at them if you're interested in what they do. Uh, they're basically uh, using various innovative ways of creating metrics for tracking uh, ESG performance of companies. Which means uh, in the future there is a possibility with better ESG reporting that we would have a better idea of how companies really are, uh, uh, really are doing in terms of um, their real life impact. But that is an, an ideal world scenario. Now, final slide as a way of conclusion. So uh, what's lost when we talk ESG and not sustainability? So ESG as a word itself, as a phrase, comes from the corporate world. And it is, uh, uh, as such, it is embedded in a specific context. Uh, which has specific objectives and rationale in mind. So the corporate world in the current let's say, system of organ uh, the way in which economic relations are organized. Uh, it means that the, the guiding principle uh, uh, is profit. So whenever profit uh, uh, is jeopardized, uh, sustainability would be sidelined or sidetracked. And, and, and otherwise, it would be irrational. Any other behavior would be considered irrational for companies. So uh, ESG, what it does, uh, when we look at things from an ESG rather than sustainability perspective, uh, it means that we're seeing um, uh, even environment, uh, the environmental, social and governance aspect from the lens of the market and the qu quest of the maximiz maximization of profit, which, uh, which ultimately means that it is, uh, ESG is a means to an end, means to profit, rather than uh, which, which, which actually serves as, let's say, a corrective to a system which created the same problems that we're trying to tackle now. Uh, rather than uh, attempting to, let's say, supersede uh, uh, th that system into something better that is able to really, from the root, uh, tackle these issues. So, uh, that was, uh, let's say, I, I don't know what's your thought on this overall, but uh, Tomislav and I both presented the positive and negative aspects of ESG, what it means, what it could mean potentially, what are its current limitations in terms of metrics and criteria. Uh, and I, I focused more uh, on, on the negative sides of it. Tomislav focused on, on, let's say, the more optimistic angle. So um, uh, I would be interested now to see what you had, what, what you were, uh, uh, what your questions are.
Uh, or Anna, would you actually let me answer the questions and then we have to, uh, Anna will have to give you instructions on the, um, on the assignment. Sure. Do you need that I stop sharing the screen or? Yeah, you can stop sharing the screen. I will, uh, I will read out the questions now. I adore greenwashing. Great. Dobrila, this only means greater responsibility, more risk and crisis management internally, externally for the people and community educations sectors or notoriously public relations managing greenwashing. Greenwashing is a business decision and not a uh, PR product. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, what I meant to say with that, with the comparison, is that uh, often they uh, they have a overlapping role. So now, because of the uh, interaction between um, uh, um, the sustainability aspect and consumer preferences, uh, even if they're separate, uh, let's say ESG department and PR department, they would have to work together. So even if there isn't very much to report on that's positive, they would find a way to present it positively. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, as I said, it's not always uh, intentions that are wrong, but sometimes it's lack of knowledge of how the standards should be implemented, how they can be implemented how uh, sometimes it doesn't have to come at the expense of, uh, of uh, prof profitability of companies, sometimes it does. So um, it, it sometimes is in, intentions, sometimes it, it is intentional, sometimes it is, it, it is not. Sometimes it's uh, poor implementation. <clears throat> Uh, Sonia, if uh, ESG disclosure is established in a company according to, for example, GRI standards and for all measurement and disclosure, there is an audit that will confirm all data that is disclosed. I think this will have a good com impact <clears throat> for company and stakeholders. Yeah, that is the idea that if you have standard standards that are um, synchronized and that, that are consistent across companies, that will uh, uh, and that are transparently disclosed, and that we have other ways of measuring um, ESG uh, performance, not just voluntary data by companies, but also some other way of tracking uh, uh, company performance overall. Uh, if we improve the metrics, then it, have, it can have a good impact for company and stakeholders. Can you name some international companies that do not use greenwashing? Uh, I'm sure, I'm sure there are. Uh, uh, you, some companies are created uh, from the outset to provide sustainable products. So uh, they wouldn't need to use greenwashing. You, greenwashing is used usually by companies whose business models are at clash, have, have some sort of, are, uh, let's say, at a mismatch with the time, with the standards of the time that are emerging. So with these uh, environmental standards, um, uh, uh, equity, equality standards. So, uh, of course, I cannot right now think of any uh, international companies that do not use uh, greenwashing, but I'm sure there are. Uh, PR is not there to cover up or spin spin anything. PR is uh, is not to cover up or spin anything, uh, of course, but it could be. PR can be used to uh, to present a positive. Or usually, it's PR is, is, is companies have PR to present a positive image of the company. They are not there to to present a negative image of the company. No PR has an objective in mind to, you know, be uh, the objective of PR, internal PR in companies is not to ser serve the uh, social good or to contribute to environmental standards of society, it is to improve the profits of the company. So. Does ESG also include carbon offsets? Yes, in cert, uh, certain metrics. In most of the metrics, it does. Mm. 
once upon a time development met development met sustainability but it was <laughs> okay should esg be audited uh, by someone that's uh, uh I mean, it wouldn't. Uh, if it's not audited, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make make much sense. As I said, if currently what we have is uh, ESG, uh, uh, the companies, it's private companies that are doing the audits, and the, usually these are also private companies. So uh, uh, it, we currently do not have uh, good auditing standards for ESG, and that makes the whole the current status, the status quo on ESG reporting, uh, quite a problematic, uh, let's say that's why I cannot be right now positive about where ESG is and its role, its purpose. Is the PR there then sometimes to serve for crisis management and damage control? Um, in my opinion, yes, uh, of course. I mean, that's part of the, that's part of the services that PR companies offer to serve crisis management, damage control, reputation management. One of the services that PR companies offer is to uh, remove from Google search engines from the first five pages the negative, uh, negative uh, information or output that appears for a certain uh, company's performance. So, uh, again, uh, this also has an impact on ESG. If you have negative impact of a certain company or a negative rating, and you have another company, ESG rating company that provides positive rating, then they would make sure, the PR department would make sure that the positive rating appears higher up on Google and the negative appears lower. Uh, you're talking about unethical things, that is not PR. No, um, I'm not... Uh, I, I don't, I mean, I'm, I, other, uh, with the exception of, let's say, religious contexts, I don't talk about ethics, so I don't, I don't see ethics as, uh, as part of the main guiding principles of companies. The main, the reason why companies exist is not to uh, enhance or diffuse ethical norms and principles, it is to make profit. I mean, that's what they measure their annual um, uh, uh, performance based on, you know, profit. They don't, I need to, they don't, uh, they don't, they don't measure it on the basis of how ethical they were. Of course, they would use it as part of the PR of uh, the company to say that they're ethical, but they wouldn't, that, that's not the reason why they exist. They're not a religious institution or, or a philosophical, let's say, uh, or a philosophy faculty. PR companies exist to make profit for, I mean, if they, you can do PR on behalf of uh, NGOs or you can do PR on behalf of, it, it can be a choice to make, but if you're a PR as part of a company, the main goal of the PR is to be advancing uh, uh, the, the company's goals. Okay, the role of PR is to manage the public's expectation. We're talking about recent history with the rise of technology, social media regulations. Yeah, and that's, uh, I mean, inevitably because of the, especially younger generations, because of their, because of their, uh, let's say, higher demands on sustainability and because of the whole environmental movement, PR has to, uh, companies need to be aware of their expectations and in that sense uh, it, it can also have a positive impact because it is responding to the it has to have feedback uh, with the with the public and its expectations the consumers expectations yes Minka is there a standardized uh, mat matrix with questions issues to be analyzed or each company will be used will, um, will be in favor Is there standardized matrix with questions, issues to be analyzed? Um, each of these you know, in, uh, com companies, uh, each of these metrics, uh, I mean, I mentioned some of them. Uh, 
they have various ways of uh, various criteria that they focus on. So you have, uh, and you can have a look at the specific uh, uh, ESG. Uh, so there is, just to give you an example, there are over 600 ESG ratings and rankings currently available worldwide. One example, sustainability industry rank. If you want to check it out to see what criteria they use, carbon disclosure project, uh, Bloomberg ESG disclosure score, but they often don't disclose their methodologies and assessment tools. So sometimes they do, but uh, often they don't. They wouldn't disclose their methodology. I mean, it, it's complicated to be per se. It's quite complicated to be to be. Uh, uh, because of these inherent methodological uh, limitations, it, it's quite complicated to be uh, comparing between uh, the various aspects of ESG and uh, making it consistent over in, between industries. In some industries, cannot be tracked against the same criteria as others. And I'm gonna uh, because we have very uh, very little time left. I'm gonna ask uh, Anna to explain the assignment. Okay, Adela, do you see my screen and the rest of the team, but only I can hear you? Yeah, we can see it. Thank you. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Adela, for your part of the presentation and for explaining all questions. So uh, my name is Anna Kolba. Maybe some of you remember me from the course one where I was also included in the explanation of the team assignment and individual assignment for Professor Nevenduic. So here I am today to explain the team assignment for this week. So this week, uh, Professor Pukšac, uh, together with me, we will be in charge of for answering your questions for this team assignment. So in case if after this you have any additional questions on the team assignment, please feel free to send us an email. So. Your uh, team assignment this week is to propose a baseline criterion calculation method for at least one criteria and one factor. So I will now explain it a bit more detail. So as Adela uh, and Thomas have explained to us very well that um, the ESG uh, in total, uh, the methodology is not yet fully standardized. Um, the idea here is that you select a one criteria and one factor because ESG, like all the criteria uh, and all factors, it will be, of course, too time consuming. Uh, so here, maybe you don't see because the font is quite small, but here we have environment, social and governance. They already, um, uh, they, uh, the Adela and Tomislav already explained. So first you, ex you select, will you go in the environmental, social or governance? So you need to select one factor. Uh, and then you one criteria, and then you select one specific factor which we'd like to propose a baseline criteria calculation method. So, for example, for environmental, you can select greenhouse gas emissions, was, uh, water and wastewater management, air quality impact. Uh, for social, you can uh, you can select diversity, equality, and inclusions, etc. So this was all uh, mentioned during the presentation, so I will not go into details on this. Uh, so just to, um, but just to emphasize this, to, to the, so there won't be any mistakes. Or in case if you want more, sure, no problem, but you need to at least one factor and one criteria. Okay, so this should be um, done for, for, let's say, for one company. And our idea was that you select also the company which you selected in the previous week. However, if you think that for some reason this may, uh, that this company is not such a good selection of, like it was for the last week, or that maybe it will be easier for you to select another company, you are free to select another company. As I said, we encourage you to select the same one. So you maybe already have some data about them, etc. But uh, we, you can also select if you want some other company. So um, I will just now give you one very brief 
examples on the, um, on how to propose this baseline criteria calculation method, and also maybe to tell what is some kind of scope we expect from you. So, for example, because we are from the power engineering, maybe this is topic more closer for me. Um, and we also, what Thomas already mentioned, we also um, started to work in something with banks about this because they want to be ready once this becomes to be obligatory. So for example, for green gas, gas emissions, if in case if you want to calculate a baseline criteria uh, calculation method, there are also some um, factors which we call primary energy factors, which are uh, in basis factors uh, and uh, greenhouse gas emission, um, emissions factors. We say, okay, one kilowatt hour of natural gas consumption in Croatia is equal to this amount of CO2. One kilowatt hour of electricity uh, used is equal to this uh, to this CO2 uh, emissions. And then it's uh, make it it make it easier uh, for you to uh, put it all together on the level of CO2. However, you can also select any other um, factors. So for example, you can say. Um, diversity, uh, inclusions, for example, I don't know, um, any any other of these, any, uh, uh, any other of these uh, factors and criteria. Um, what we understand is that you will not have uh, the data uh, because these are quite often not open data. So here you don't need to calculate or uh, like quantify those um, those figures. Uh, those results, you only need to propose a baseline criterion calculation method. So you have also on the on the Moodle on the forum, mm -hmm, um, you have also on the Moodle and on the forum, uh, you have a uh, different type of literature. As one also, I see that Sonia already put. You have uh, also their GAG protocol. Um, you have also about something about smart uh, objectives. Okay, so now when you propose uh, one baseline criteria collect, uh, collection method, the, your next step is to develop smart, which are specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bounded strategies. And here I refer more to also to the measures for ESG criteria improvement for this company selected here or in the first week or the new company. Uh, here at least five measures should be developed. So what I also want to say is that, um, Sonia, you also remind me with your comment, is that um, because this is uh, maybe some of you, I assume that most of you don't have some maybe a previous experience with ESG, uh, and this is also a task you, the, the assignment which you have every week at assignment. So we understand that you cannot, of course, invest a huge amount of time into this assignment. Uh, the scope of which you are here consider is we can say the factor that company can directly, um, directly, uh, can directly. Uh, be responsible to. I mean, just I will now explain more into more details. So, um, so um, just to to make it clear. So, for example, in this also GG protocol, for example, we have three scopes of um, GG emissions. So we also have um, the GG emissions which are related to the, um, let's say, the transport of the fuel from one uh, from one station to a power plant, uh, transport of um, distribution of electricity to the, let's say, I would say now here, the store. Uh, there are also some emissions uh, linked to this, and there are also some emissions linked to the product which are produced, but which will be later occurred. What we see, uh, what we ask in, in this assignment is to propose um, a baseline criterion calculation method that only covers the store. So, for example, in the case if you have one store, uh, they have emissions for heating, cooling, um, and for electricity. Um, uh, for ele electricity, but you don't need to, for example, um, propose let's say this doesn't need to include the emissions which are linked to the um yeah to, to the 
production of uh, T-shirts in um, in undeveloped countries, in it, for example, in Asian countries and things like this. So this is just to make things more simply, uh, more simply, but also to some uh, to some extent to encourage you to uh, read more about ESGs and to search more in the scientific literature, but also on the internet because in there are different protocols. Um, um yeah so um so just a sec i will now try to i try to cover all the questions we need to suggest assessment improvements or impact improvements in company work impact um so you need to suggest esg assessment you not you don't need to um suggest how to improve the esg assessment but you need to suggest some measure, uh, measures on how to improve specific criteria. So, for example, um, you need to suggest some uh, measures which will, in this example, uh, lead to lower greenhouse gas emissions. You need to improve. You need to suggest some measures which will improve diversity, equity, and inclusions, uh, personal data security, business ethics, etc. So, even though you don't have a ba baseline data for this uh there there are also some let's we can also say some generic uh measures which could be applied to the company which you selected i i hope that uh angela i with this i answered your questions i answered your questions so for this as i said you need to um select at least five measures so uh, is are there any um uh, are there any questions on this uh in addition to this, if something is not clear. Uh, I think that I covered all of the questions asked here. So in case if you don't have some immediate questions, as I said. Uh, uh, OK, um, so what Sonia here wrote, example, reduce absolute scope one and scope two greenhouse gas emissions by 30 uh, compared to 2017 levels. So Sonia, in case if you do this, that would be great. Um, I think that not all participants here are so familiar with this, so uh, so familiar uh, with uh, the this specific protocol or maybe some other protocols uh or maybe some other protocols so for example as i said you can also for, for us it is fine to for in this you to also to um focus only on scope two but i just don't want to make some other some confusions to other participants we are which are not familiar with scope two so just something which are which the company or let's say the store is directly it, the emissions or some other type of the criteria which directly happens in the uh, which they are directly responsible to so we need what's here you need you don't need to be spo so specific you can put like for example how to reduce by 33 percent compared to the previous level previous uh, levels in 2017 but for this you need to conduct quite detailed calculation you need to know the baseline the what was the those um, what was in the reference here so you need to um explain more i would say general activities which will in general lead to improved criteria you don't need to uh, specify in the percentages or um, assess the reference reference here because if we go with this this is quite a bit big task and we are aware that um you have very short deadline for this and also that maybe not all of you have a lot of um experience with this um Okay, I don't see any questions now, so I think that maybe you don't have any immediate questions, but as I say, Tomislav and I uh, will be available for you. We'll be trying to be as responsive as possible in this time when you before you need to submit your assignment. So in case you have any other questions, feel free to contact us on email, um, you, our climate communication emails. If this is all, and I think it is, uh, I would then like like to thank you um, all for uh, joining this webinar and uh, we see we'll, we will be in touch in the next days i believe uh, and we see also next week when we will call when we will talk about risk and vulnerability assessment when thomas will talk okay see you all bye